We'll be talking about Queen Esther. Take off <laughs> Mordecai's head. You were put in this position for such a time as this. God's hand is on our lives. What is going on to all of you writers out there? It's your girl V here and I'm back with another video. And in today's video, I'm inside of my prayer closet. I think in a, another video, I think when I was speaking about my journey of no longer being lukewarm, right? And how I got to that point, I was in here also. But now I'm giving you guys a better angle, right? Talk about a better angle. Let's dive into this video. As you see from the title down below, we'll be talking about Queen Esther. Yes, Queen Esther from the Bible. Because I recently started a Bible book club on my Victories with Victoria Instagram page. And I have been thoroughly enjoying it. It has been a blessing to me, okay? I don't know if anyone else is out there checking the page out and seeing um, what I've been posting, but I hope it's a blessing to you out there as well. We have done Esther so far, we did Job, and we are currently in Nehemiah, and it's a beautiful story. All of them have been beautiful stories. The Bible is full of beautiful, beautiful, amazing, heroic, devastating, thrilling stories and romance, right? So diving into Esther, the book of Esther has 10 chapters in the Bible. It's a quick read if you ever want to take the time to read it. When I was doing the Bible Book Club, we only do a chapter a day, so it took us 10 days to read it because we're doing 10 chapters a day. And I just want to share with you guys three lessons I learned while reading Esther and three important events that took place in the story of Esther, right? Just to give like a little recap of our time in Esther in the Bible Book Club. I want to really transition the Bible Book Club that takes place on my Instagram page to YouTube as well, right? So I guess moving forward, I'll do the Bible Book Club on my Instagram page chapter by chapter, right? Putting a little recap chapter by chapter, and then come on YouTube and discussing the whole book once we're done. But let's just dive into Esther, please, okay? It actually begins with her not even as queen yet, right? Queen Esther had to become queen by one queen being dethroned. And that was none other than Queen Vashti, right? So let's get into it. So the first important event that happened in the story of Esther is Queen Vashti being dethroned. And when I first read this, I was thinking back to my childhood when I was watching VeggieTales. And in VeggieTales, Queen Vashti was dethroned because the king in VeggieTales asked the queen to make him a sandwich. And the queen's like, no, you make your own sandwich. And that's how she became dethroned and out of <laughs> the palace. But reading the story, it wasn't that petty, but it's still petty, but it wasn't that petty, like sandwich petty. If you look at chapter one, verse 11, 10 and 11, it says, when King Xerxes was in high spirits because of the wine, he told his seven eunuchs who attended him to bring Queen Vashti to him with a royal crown on her head. That's what he told his eunuchs, which are probably like his assistants, to, queen, to bring Queen Vashti with a crown on her head. He simply wanted to parade his beautiful wife around, right? He wanted the nobles and all the other men to gaze at her beauty, for she was a beautiful woman. But when they conveyed to the king's order to Queen Vashti, guess what? She refused to come. This made the king furious and he burned with anger. That was how Queen Vashti got dethroned because the king, the king was in high spirits. He wanted to show off his beautiful wife and queen. And she's like, no, <laughs> get somebody else to do it. So since she's gone, they needs to be a queen to replace her. So that enters Esther. So now I am entering into the second most pivotal part of the story right and this enters Mordecai. Mordecai was Esther's cousin right and Mordecai was there in the story to bring guidance to bring wisdom to Esther because he was the older cousin live longer see more you know how they say you're older wiser you know as you have experiences 
So Esther really leaned on Mordecai to help her navigate um, this new role as queen. The reason why, another reason why Mordecai was important because Mordecai held a position around the king, right? He wasn't a close position as a king, but he was around him. And it was important because Mordecai actually saved the king's life one day. The king was about to be assassinated. If you go to Esther 2, verses 21, one day as Mordecai was on duty at the king's gate, he was a gatekeeper, two of the king's eunuchs who were on guard at the door of the king's private quarter became angry at King Xerxes and plotted to assassinate him. But Mordecai heard about the plot and gave the information to Queen Esther. She then told the king about it and gave Mordecai credit for the report. When an investigation was made and Mordecai's story was found to be true, the two men were impaled on a sharpened pole. So we see here that not only does Esther have um, Mordecai, her cousin, working near the king, she has Mordecai giving her wisdom, giving her guidance, and now Mordecai has saved the king, which now puts Mordecai in a better position for the king to see that Mordecai is a good worker, an honest worker, a faithful worker, a loyal worker, right? And this is gonna play a pivotal part in the future, right? So let's remember how Mordecai saved the king's life and how Mordecai is also Queen Esther's cousin. It all plays a part in God's guidance in all of this, right? So number three, the third most important event in the story is Haman's plot to kill and destroy the Jewish people, right? Haman and Mordecai have been beefing all along. So that's another reason why it was important that Mordecai saved the king, because Haman did not like Mordecai, and Haman was the king's right-hand man. And since, Morde since Haman was the king's right-hand man, he can whisper into the king's ears different plans that he wanted and the king would carry it through because that's his right hand man so he trusts his right hand man. So Haman one day plots against the Jews. So sometimes later King Xerxes promoted Haman, um, so now he's at a bit of a high position, right? He promotes Haman and because he got this new promotion, he wants people to respect him, right? He's having a little power trip, making him the most powerful. So King Xerxes promoted Haman making him the most powerful official in the empire. All the king officials would bow down before Haman to show him respect whenever he passed by. So that was the thing. Whenever he passed by, they would bow down to him, for so the king had commanded. But Mordecai refused to bow down or show him respect. Not because he disrespected Haman, but because Mordecai had his boundaries, because he bowed down to no one but God and God alone. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not bow down to him, he was filled with rage. He had learned of Mordecai's nationality, so he decided it was, it was not enough to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, he looked for a way to destroy all the Jews throughout the entire empire of Xerxes. So, with this, we see that, Morde that Haman is so upset that he wants to take off <laughs> Mordecai's head. He's like, you know what? It's not enough to just destroy Mordecai and Mordecai alone. I'm gonna wipe out all of his people now that he's expressed himself as a Jew. So he sees that if Mordecai's not bound to me, any Jew is not going to bow to me. So I need to take away all of them. So now all of this is in play and it's all part of God's plan to get rid of Queen Vashti, to enter in Esther, and then for Esther and Mordecai to be in such a position where the king views them in high regard and for Haman to plot to kill kill the Jews, because guess what? Queen Esther and, and Mordecai are both Jews that the king holds in high regard. So now, Haman trying to destroy all the Jews enters Esther's courage to now go before the king and plead with the king that he does not destroy and kill her people, right? And I just wanna bring up one funny thing, right? This is funny to me, I don't know if y'all would find this funny, but it was a thing back then that, let me just read it here. It's Esther 4, verse 11. All the king officials and even the people in the province know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his golden scepter and the king has not called for me to come 
to him for 30 days. So pretty much Esther is afraid to go to the king because now Mordecai is seeing this decree to kill all the Jews. And Mordecai is telling Esther, you were put in this position for such a time as this. Such a beautiful line. For such a time as this, you were put in this position. And Mordecai is basically like telling her like, this is something you have to do. It's worth the risk. Take that step of courage and knowing that God's going to be with you, right? The same God that you pray to is going to be with you and you shouldn't have to worry. So Mordecai tells Esther, don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you escape all the Jews that are being killed. He reminds her, right? Like if Haman's decree to kill all the Jews is really put to pass and, and all the Jews die, you are going to be among the Jews that will die. Either you die before the king going to him uninvited or you die when they kill all the Jews. So that's kind of like you pick your poison, but going before the king is a 50-50 chance you will die. But letting Haman's decree killing all the Jews, that's a 100% chance you will die. <laughs> you following me, right? Esther, Esther now sees this realization that either way, death could be the result, but at least going before the king, I have like a 50-50 chance of winning because maybe he'll have mercy on me, right? In which we see he does. The king has mercy on Esther. Esther invites the king to dinner and Haman to dinner. And she doesn't tell the king of Haman's plan on that dinner, but he invites him to another dinner. But the night before the second dinner, the king has trouble sleeping. And while the king has, whenever the king has trouble sleeping, he invites his, uh, a scribe to come in and read to him about his day. And then the scribe was reading about the day when Mordecai saved him. So then the king asks the scribe, did we do anything for Mordecai, the guy who saved my life? And then the scribe's like, no, we didn't. So then just then Haman was walking by and he asked Haman, what should I do for a guy who has been good to me and saved my life and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him? And Haman thinks the king is talking about himself. So he's like, I will put him in the best robes, let him ride the horses and take him all around the town. And let everyone see that he is a big shot, right? And then King Zuch is like, all right, great. Do that for Mordecai. And that crushes Haman because not one, because one, it's not him. And two, he doesn't like Mordecai because Mordecai has not been bound to him and Mordecai according to him, is going to be killed soon with the decree to kill all the Jews. So it pained Haman to have to take Mordecai, put him on the horse, put him on a robe, put in that royal robe on him, and take him all the town. So now the second dinner comes and Esther, Haman, and the king is there. And Esther finally, with all the courage she had within her, tells the king, that Haman is plotting to kill my people and just can't be. Queen Esther replied, if I have found favor with the king and if it is pleases the king to grant my request, I ask that my life and the lives of my people will be spared. For my people and I have been sold to those who would kill, slaughter, and annihilate us. If we had merely been sold as slaves, I will remain quiet. For that we were too for that would be too trivial as a matter to warrant disturbing the king. And then King Xerxes, so shocked and like confused, who would do such a thing? King Xerxes demanded, who would be so presumptuous to touch you? Queen replied, This wicked Haman and is our adversary and our enemy. Haman grew pale with fright before the king and queen. Then the king jumped to his feet in a rage and went out into the garden palace. Haman, however, stayed behind to plead for his life with Queen Esther. So the same queen he was about to kill now was pleading for his life, for he knew that the king intended to kill him, which the king did. So that essentially is the story of Esther, right? It's such a beautiful story that shows like courage. It shows how God's lives, God's hand is on our lives, just moving pieces around. When we seem confused and like distraught and saddened with everything that's happening like only God can see that he's moving pieces together that will bring you nothing but peace and love and happiness and joy and if we just 
trust in God's plan and do what God has called us to do. Because with Queen, Ves Queen Veshi being the throne and Queen Esther entering, she also had to play a part. Not only did she have to pray to God, trust God, and listen to God, she had to obey God and do her part by going to the king, right? Even though it, it could have meant her dying. And she had to um, pretty much tell the king that you and Haman have this decree out to kill my people. Even though Queen Xerxes did not know that she was among the people that he was about to kill, right? And it just showed if Esther was not in that position, all the Jews would have been killed, including Esther and Mordecai. And that would have been horrible. It shows that we should just trust God's way because God's way always wins. So the three important lessons are kind of like already intertwined was the courage because Esther exemplifies courage by risking her life to approach King Xerxes and advocate for her people. Um, this teaches us the importance of bravery. That's another key term I wanted to use to, um, right now is bravery. That we have to be brave in our way we live for God, for God because we know the way we, the way God wants us to live for him is counterculture to the way that society pushes us on how to live and how the media pushes us on how to live and live for God boldly you know and being bold in how you live is, is bravery because it's gonna come with a lot of like judgment and stares and questions and it may it, it may break you but you just have to be brave and number two is God's hands in our life and trusting God's hand in our life that everything's happening for a reason. And then number three is faithfulness and obedience to put as one. That Esther obedience to Mordecai's guidance and her commitment to fill her role as queen, seeing that she was put as queen for such a time as this, right? To fulfill God's plan of showing that the Jewish people are meant to be protected. So <laughs> all in all, that wraps up our time reading the beautiful story of Queen Esther who exemplifies bravery, courage, obedience. I just absolutely love this story. Like if you want to ever check out the story, you can definitely read it. It has 10 chapters, a nice quick read. If you want to have a laugh and a giggle, watch the veggie tale version of Queen Esther. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. This officially kicks off my Bible book club on YouTube. So if you guys watch to the end, Thank you for watching. Drop down BBC down below. You know, it's like maybe it's like a news station. BBC is also Bible Book Club, and it's kicking off now. So I hope you guys loved this video. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I will see you guys in the next Bible Club Book Club where we discuss Job. And my is Job heart wrenching, but also triumphant, also but heart wrenching. <laughs> Alright, I love you guys and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!